My name's Ken Alex. I'm with the Center for Law, Energy, and Environment uh, at UC Berkeley, and we'll be moderating today's webinar. We have a very full hour for you. Um, I want to thank the Center, uh, the California China Climate Institute, for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, and to thank all of you for, for joining uh, our dialogue, a very uh, important topic, uh, particularly in light of the uh, IPCC sixth assessment report identifying uh, short lived climate pollutants as one of the most important uh, set of actions to be taken on climate um, in the near term. Um, if you have a couple of uh, housekeeping items, uh, if you want to ask a question, please enter into the Q&A function uh, at any time, and we'll do our best to, to answer them. We'll have a, a Q&A session if we have time towards the end of the hour. Um, so please feel free to put in your questions. In addition, uh, we have sim simultaneous translation for this dialogue. Um, you can select your uh, um, preferred language um, by clipping, clicking hopefully on the global icon uh, at the bottom of the screen. I'm not seeing it on my screen, but maybe I don't have that. Oh yeah, I have, I have to use a drop down menu. So maybe some of the uh, people will need a drop down. But at any rate, uh, feel free to check that box if you need it. I'm gonna provide a very short introduction given the limited amount of time. And then I'm gonna introduce our distinguished speakers. Um, so let me just jump right into it here. Uh, as many of you likely know, uh, super or sometimes as they're called short-lived climate pollutants, primarily hydrofluorocarbons, black carbon and methane result in as much as 45% of, of the human caused warming. Um, just focusing on one of those, methane, for a moment. Methane is about 84 times more potent than CO2 over a 20 year period and contributes over 25% of the gross warming. So uh, very big deal. Um, and methane has been increasing its concentration in the atmosphere at a record breaking rate over the last number of years. It is the strategy identified with the greatest potential to de decrease warming over the next two decades. If we can stop methane emissions now, methane will be gone from the atmosphere in about 15 years, unlike CO2, which will remain for potentially hundreds of years. Uh, the very recent UN IPCC sixth assessment report that I mentioned states that strong, rapid and sustained reductions in methane emissions would limit the warning effect resulting from declining aerosol pollution and would improve air quality. And that's just one of, of the, the major short-lived climate pollutants. So action on this uh, set of pollutants is, is essential. Um, and today for our discussion for our webinar, we have uh, a presentation um, from Dr. Zhang Lin and Nina Khanna. Uh, they're gonna present their work and findings from their report, which is entitled Opportunities to Tackle Short-Lived Climate Pollutants and Other Greenhouse Gases for China. And then we'll have commentary uh, from Professor uh, Zhang Xin Hu and Matt Botel. Um, so I wanna introduce a little more thoroughly all four of our speakers and then turn it over uh, to them for their presentation. Um, first off, uh, let me get my bio here, uh, is Dr. Jean Lin, who's the Nat Simons Presidential Chair in China Energy Policy at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. He's a staff scientist in the China Energy Group and an adjunct professor at the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Lin's research is focused on energy and climate policy, energy and emissions pathways, electricity market and planning, low carbon 
economic transitions and appliance efficiency issues in China. Um, and from 2016 to 2020, he was a co-director of the Berkeley Tsinghua Joint Research Center on Energy and Climate Change, a collaborative initiative between Berkeley Lab, U University of California, Berkeley, and Tsinghua University in China. Um, Nina Shang Kana is a principal scientific engineer, engineering associate and co-leader of the Emerging Economies Research Program at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Her recent research focuses on techno-economic bottom-up modeling and scenario analysis of technologies and policies for accelerating the clean energy transition in China and globally. She is also a contributing author of the IPCC Six Assessment Report Chapter on Mitigation and Development Pathways in the Mid to Near Term. And when, when they complete their presentation, we're gonna have commentary uh, from Professor Zhang Xin Hu. He's a professor at Peking University. Uh, he was also a member of the WMO UN, UNEP Steering Committee for the 2022 Scientific Assessment of Ozone Depletion and a member of the POPs Review Committee of the Stockholm Convention. He has participated in the Montreal Protocol since the 1990s and has advised on many policies adopted over the last four decades in the phase out and phase down of CFCs, HF, HCFCs and HFCs. So an expert for sure. Um, and then our final commentator is Matthew Botel, uh, who's an assistant division chief at the California Air Resources Board. Uh, in this capacity, Matt oversees the Air Resources Board work to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from electricity, industry, transportation, and other sectors. Matt has been at CARB for 14 years, working on various regulatory and incentive programs targeted at reducing greenhouse gases and air pollution. So a very expert panel. And with that, without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Lin and to Nina Kana. Thank you, Ken, for that nice introduction. And thanks to CCCI for hosting today's webinar. Our paper is mostly focused on opportunity in China. So I'm very pleased to see that we have Professor Hu from Peking University, as well as uh, Matt from ARB, who can share the California perspective. Uh, next slide. So why do we focus on so-called short-lived climate pollutants? It's a, it's a mouthful of a name. SLCP referred to a group of greenhouse gases uh, that include methane, F gases, and black carbon, which typically have a short lifetime uh, than CO2. But they are extremely potent, as Ken alluded, in trapping heat, much more so than CO2. Uh, for example, over the 100-year time frame, methane is about 28 times more potent than CO2. But over the 20-year time frame, it's 84 to 86 times more potent than CO2 in, in its ability trapping heat. For HFCs, their global warming potential are in the thousands. So that's why they're often called super pollutants. As Ken mentioned already, rapid reduction in super pollutants can avoid up to 0.6 degrees Celsius of warming by 2050. And thus it's critical in limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius by providing the time we need for mitigation effort on CO2 to take effect. Uh, in addition, uh, N2O is roughly 300 times more potent than CO2 in trapping heat. Uh, it's already contributing to roughly 10% of global warming. It's the largest depleter of ozone layer that's not included uh, under Montreal Protocol. So one of the remaining uh, gases to be regulated. Most recently, China has recognized the need to reduce non-CO2 greenhouse gases by including it in its own 2060 carbon neutrality goal. Uh, next. 
So reducing super pollutants also offers large benefits in terms of air quality, health, and agricultural outputs. Uh, for example, uh, according to recent studies by UEP and uh, WMO, uh, fast action uh, in reducing super pollutants could avoid roughly 1.2 million premature deaths and reducing crop loss by 50 million tons per year globally. So that's a very large co-benefit in, in addition to the climate effect uh, we, we explained before. Next. So recognizing the very important role uh, super pollutants play in overall mitigation effort in reducing global uh, warming, many countries have started to include them in their national contributions and draft policies to reduce them. For example, the EU has included super pollutants as a part of the overall GHG target of 55% reduction um, by 2030 and also have a timeline of reducing HFC um, emissions by two thirds, uh, faster than um, the Kigali amendment required. Not surprisingly, California perhaps has a, one of the most comprehensive set of target, uh, including an overall target of GHG emission reduction by 40% by 2030, including all the short lived climate um, pollutants but also specific uh, uh, gas target, you know, for example, for methane, the reduction target is 40% by 2030, 40% uh, reduction of F gases by 2030, and a 50% reduction of black carbon by 2030. Uh, so now I'll turn over to my colleague, Nina, to talk about our scenario work. Thank you very much, Zhang. Um, so now I think we'll, as Zhang mentioned, turn to focus more specifically on China, looking at understanding the current role of non-CO2 greenhouse gases in China, and then also discussing some of the uh, mitigation pathways that we analyze as part of this uh, project and report. So in 2019, China's Ministry of Ecology and Environment submitted its greenhouse gas inventory data for the year 2014. And based on this data, we can see from the pie chart on the left, that non-CO2 greenhouse gases accounted for about 18% of China's total greenhouse gas emissions with a total non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions of 2.2 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. And we can see, and that's in a hundred year GWP, we can see from the pie chart on the top right that more than half of this was in the form of methane with another about third in the form of N2O or nitrous oxide. And then with smaller emissions of various HFC gases, but also a little bit of emissions of SF6 and PFC gases. If we turn to look at the pie chart at the bottom right, we can see where these different emissions are coming from. We can see that of the different sectors where methane, N2O, and F gases are being emitted, uh, agriculture is the largest overall sector, but it's primarily in the form of methane and N2O. There's also emissions coming from the energy sector, as well as industrial processes, um, and then a smaller share coming from waste and wastewater. And in our scenario work, we looked at the emission reduction potential in each of these sectors for the different gases that are being emitted. So as I mentioned, understanding kind of the current context of non-CO2 greenhouse gases in China, we then use our bottom-up uh, energy and emissions model, as well as the development of scenarios to evaluate potential mitigation pathways for both CO2 and non-CO2. We developed a total of four different scenarios to represent different scenario storylines of greenhouse gas mitigation adoption. First, we developed two scenarios that were focused primarily on CO2 emissions. That includes our reference scenario of continued policies and decarbonization that's consistent with China's targets as well as recent policies. And then we also developed a deeper CO2 mitigation scenario with um, faster and more aggressive decarbonization. On top of that, we then added two additional scenarios really focusing explicitly on non-CO2 mitigation. 
Our cost-effective non-CO2 mitigation scenario is where we assume full adoption of cost effective non-CO2 mitigation technologies by 2050. And that's based on a, our own cost-effective analysis that we conducted, which John will introduce later in the presentation. But essentially, we consider full adoption of key technologies um, with average cost of below seven US dollar per ton of CO2 equivalent reduction. Then we also develop a deep non-CO2 mitigation scenario where we assume the application of additional technologically feasible measures in oil sector as well as wastewater and industry sectors. So these are measures that have higher costs um, than the previous cost-effective scenario, but we also accelerated the full adoption of current cost-effective measures by 2030 instead of 2050. So we're adopting more measures, but we're also adopting the cost-effective measures earlier than the cost-effective scenario. So this next slide shows our results uh, in terms of total non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions by the different scenario. The line chart on the left represents the emissions in 100-year GWP, and then the chart on the right shows it in 20-year GWP, because as uh, both Ken and Zhang mentioned, um, certain pollutants have, certain pollutant gases have shorter lifetimes when you express it differently. So if we look at the 100-year GWP chart on the left, we can see that compared to our reference scenario, which is the black line of continued policies, deep CO2 mitigation scenario shown in blue does not noticeably change non-CO2 greenhouse gases. And this is partly because of decarbonization that's already happening under both of these scenarios. But then we can see that if we add and adopt cost-effective non-CO2 mitigation measures, then this results in a significant decline in the total non-CO2 greenhouse gases over time um, and can achieve about a 50% reduction from the reference scenario by the year 2050. If we consider faster adoption of cost-effective non-CO2 if we consider faster adoption of cost-effective non-CO2 mitigation measures by 2030 and also the adoption of additional measures with higher average costs that's represented by the green line in our deep non-CO2 mitigation scenario, then we can achieve more significant reductions earlier years, but also achieve a total reduction of 56% in the year 2050 in terms of the total non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions. So this is quite significant. We also compare our two non-CO2 scenarios, the cost-effective mitigation and the deep non-CO2 mitigation scenario to other recently published scenario studies that included non-CO2 greenhouse gas um, results for China specifically. And we found that our cost-effective scenario shown in the solid black line and also our deep mitigation shown in the dotted black line were actually well within the range of other scenarios that were included in IPCC fifth assessment reports database of two degree compatible um, pathway scenarios. We also noted that our scenario, um, our two scenarios were kind of within the bounds of a 1.5 degree scenario, which was published in a late 2020 study by the influential uh, Tsinghua University. And that's shown in the purple dots um, that is actually well within the range of that 1.5 degree scenario as well. And you can see in the year 2050, their endpoint is actually virtually the same as our uh, deep mitigation scenario endpoint, which was pretty interesting. So this comparison really helped us validate our scenario results, but also to really contextualize the mitigation that's needed uh, in order to reduce climate change impacts and also to understand what are the cumulative greenhouse gas emissions uh, from 2015, 2015 to 2050 in terms of non-CO2 greenhouse gases. If we turn to look at the non-CO2 reduction potential by subsector, for key years, uh, that's 2030 and 2050, we can see that in 2030, total annual reductions of just non-CO2 greenhouse gases will reach over 1.1 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. And this grows to 1.5 gigaton CO2 equivalent by 2050. 
If we look at it from the perspective of different gases, we can see that for F gases, the largest reduction potential is in HFC23 destruction that's associated with, um, or destruction of HFC23 that's associated with HCFC22 production. And that is shown in the red part, the red bar, as well as transitioning to lower GWP refrigerants in uh, the air conditioning sector, particularly in the room air conditioning sector in the residential um, sector. And that's shown in the blue bar on the chart. If we turn to look at methane, we can see that despite decarbonization, there's actually still significant reduction potential from reduced activity in the fossil fuel sectors, particularly in coal mining sector, that's shown in the upper green bars um, in 2030, and also from changes in rice cultivation, manure management, and improved livestock productivity in agriculture that's represented by the orange bar at the very bottom. For N2O, it's primarily from industrial processes, such as adipic acid, which is shown in the light green bar, as well as reduced fertilizer use for agricultural soils in the agriculture sector. So this chart and this um, results really help us contextualize where the reduction potential is, as well as the types of non co 2 greenhouse gas that's being affected by the different mitigation measures that we deploy. And with that, I'll turn it back to Zhang to talk more about the policy implications of our scenario analysis. Thank you, Nina. So based on our analysis of the cost mitigation measures, we have identified roughly one gigatons mitigation potential uh, in China by 2030. Uh, if you focus on the right column, the 2030 numbers, this is translated roughly as 35 to 40% reduction uh, potential in methane emissions, including those in energy sector, agricultural waste, and roughly a 30% a reduction potential in HFC emissions, mostly in the room AC uh, uh, world, and but smaller amount also in the power generation sector as well. Um, we also identified roughly a 40% mitigation potential by 2030 for N2Os, that's uh, split between industrial and agricultural applications. And we also identified further opportunities to reduce black carbons, uh, which uh, has been covered on many different policies in China, both in terms of diesel fuel standards, uh, some of the fuel switching, uh, residential and industrial processes. Next. So let me introduce um, one of the major uh, contribution we're making uh, in this analysis is really constructing this cost curve for reducing uh, non CO2 uh, greenhouse gases. So on the X axis is the quantity re reduction for particular uh, gas identified in terms of million tons CO2 equivalent. On the Y axis, are the cost mitigation in terms of dollar per ton of CO2 equivalent. So for example, you can see on the, the further left bar, that the right bar below zero, that's actually uh, indicating a native cost in terms of natural gas uh, production uh, process in capturing the methane leakage for, for productive usage. So that's like turning into a benefit. And uh, the next um, orange chart in the HFC22 production process, you can see there's extremely low cost potential, um, roughly uh, in terms of 150 or so um, million tons of CO2 equivalent. The next to that is the uh, room AC um, HFC reduction potential in transition to a low GWP refrigerant probably one of the largest mitigation opportunity are in the messing uh, um, capture or use utilization in the coal mining sector, I think roughly 270 million tons CO2 equivalent. Next to that, you can see another lower bar in green color in N2O mitigation, uh, mostly in deep acid production process. So this goes on and on. And, and as cost goes up, you can see that the highest cost included in this 2030 mitigation lists are in actually in the oil field, roughly close to about $70 per ton CO2 equivalent. 
but adding all this together, the average cost of abatement uh, for this uh, 1 billion ton of CO2 equivalent is roughly $10 on average. We also identified a few opportunities uh, that are significant, but we don't have a good cost estimate yet. This is including agricultural soil mitigation measures and, and also measures in uh, commercial EC, industrial and commercial refrigeration as well. Next. So after taking all the mitigation measures we identified, by 2050, there's still roughly 1.2 gigatons of emission left in the non-CO2 gases. So this shows the distribution of that. Uh, you know, two thirds of that is methane, uh, mostly in agricultural sector. That's essentially defined, you know, what we need to focus on the next phase of research, but also mitigation effort is finding cost effective and also scalable solutions to deal with the remaining um, emission, uh, which is still a significant. Uh, remember, China has a 2060 carbon neutrality target, which including uh, non CO greenhouse gas emission as well. So we definitely need to cut this emission down further. Next slide. So in conclusion, uh, we have identified some of the near term and the mid term mitigation potential, particularly industrial sector in terms of HFC gas and N2O reductions. Um, China has recently ratified Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, which is one of the most well-established international environmental treaties. And there's a well-built implementation uh, mechanism in place. So that's actually very, very uh, solid mechanisms uh, to scheme up the solution. The potentially also complementary policy opportunities to, to gain further reduction, for example, by simultaneously improving the energy efficiency requirement for both uh, for most of the cooling equipment, you can further reducing energy related greenhouse gas emissions as well. Um, methane, the largest potential are in coal mining, Sean. Uh, it, there's also significant coal benefit in terms of safety um, in, in reducing coal bed methane leakage as well. Um, there is also a potentially emerging global consensus in developing uh, protocols on, on methane control in the oil and gas sector, which I think Ken's working on as well. Next. As I mentioned before, methane will be the largest remaining non zero greenhouse gas emission in 2050. To address that, and particularly in the agricultural sector, uh, there's a set of challenges that we yet have to confront. For one, it is a highly decentralized system and requires participation of millions of farmers. You know, for example, changing irrigation practices, changing feedstock to animals. That all requires scientific innovation to come up with technical solutions. We also have to define what are the social mechanisms to introduce those methodologies and to have adoption by millions of small users. And, and also we may need to consider other new technologies that's emerging, for example, the plant-based protein, which potentially could have a significant reduction benefit in terms of greenhouse gas emission compared to some of the meat consumption. Um, we have yet to consider some of the behavioral changes as well in terms of dietary change. Um, I heard recently that people start adopting you know, one day a week to, to have non-meat diet, which is potentially a possibility. We have seen a recent a study that, that even suggesting potato can be a, a sub, substitute for rice in China, which potentially offer also a large reduction um, opportunity as well. One of the significant challenge in promoting policy and regulation on non-CO2 uh, greenhouse gases are due to the lack of data. So we need a much stronger MRV system to both to track and monitoring progress of any uh, policy that's being implemented. Uh, so I think that concludes our presentation. Uh, we'd like to thank our colleagues 
from IGSD for their contribution to make this uh, project possible, and also colleagues from CCCI and other reviewers of this report. Ken, back to you. Thank you very much. Um, really, really interesting, and uh, I think gives rise, at least in my mind, to quite a number of questions. Um, but I will uh, forego those uh, for the moment. But just to remind people, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and uh, hopefully we'll get to some of them towards the end. But now I'd like to talk, uh, turn to Professor Hu and uh, give him an opportunity to comment on the report and also on his work, particularly on HFCs. Dr. Uh, Professor Hu. I can, thank you. And um, first of all, I would like to thank you, thank Dr. Lin for the invitation to participate in this meeting. And uh, the report presented just uh, by Dr. Lin and Nina is regarding the, the non-CO2 emission reduction, which is very comprehensive and very meaningful in my way, in my view. The, this comprehensive research information include the international comparison to China is very rich and um, which only allows me to, uh, to learn a lot. And uh, regarding to the potential and the opportunity for the mitigation of HFC, uh, it's also, uh, aspect of our work uh, that has been committed to research for a long time. Among them, I'm very uh, much uh, it's li li like talking about the prediction and the future research. Uh, we just uh, finished one study, conclude one study yesterday, in fact, uh, regarding to the HFC 23 yesterday, you know, it just Nina mentioned that 23 is very powerful. The lifetime is like uh, 270 years. The GWP on the Kikari amendment or AR4, they using is like uh, 14,800. And uh, we may get very positive results to dealing with uh, to animate HFC 23 opportunity. <laughs> uh, so it, it like uh, Dr. Lin present the 23, basically right now it's cheaper, but uh, still we uh, spend some money and also very important waste, waste the fluoride resource because it, normally they just burning the uh, Try for a method, or we we talking about is HFC twenty three, but uh, we realize recently, at least in China, maybe U.S. and some other place also too, they develop some conversion technology, just uh, convert the twenty three to useful products. So that's uh, in in our our way. So we used to spend money and may, we may spend money next few year. And, but once the conversion technology is successful, we believe will be successful and they then definitely can save money. So that's a, one thing we thought is very positive dealing with these powerful greenhouse gases. I think it, uh, uh, Dr. Lin's report, 23 emission per year is talking about a 200 million tons CO2 equivalent, I, I guess, something like that. Uh, regarding to the field of room air condition, uh, I think it, it uh, uh, Dr. Lin and uh, his colleague and uh, some other Energy Fund, uh, Energy Fund uh, Foundation organization, they join promote and then reducing the emission of HFC in known as known air condition sector. They did a lot of work. 
And uh, we definitely already see results today because uh, since this year, the HCF22 and R410A refrigerant air condition is going down and going down because their GWP is pretty high. And the HFC32 is already dominated the market in China. But unfortunately, the ex exportation of air condition not, a, not as good as China market. That surprised me because uh, is, we still export, the China or still export some uh, 22, HCF22 and four, uh, R14A, that's high GWP products. We definitely believe the 290 is better energy efficiency and the low GWP refrigerants. But unfortunately today, we didn't see the big market, but we believe that if we can solve the security problem, there is still potential reduction for the loan air conditioning sector. I think it, Dr. Ling's report emphasized the potential for this sector. And one, one I maybe just offered one is automobile sector is really interesting. And uh, everybody you knows uh, the, the China is promoting the electricity vehicle. So once the, as we understand the latest research, because the electricity vehicle, you need not only for cooling, you also need a heating during the winter. So CO2 technology is getting quite bigger. The technology is getting really uh, progress. And uh, this month, actually this month, there is a big uh, workshop talking about the CO2 technology for the movable air condition. So especially for the vehicle, uh, electricity vehicle. So if so, I think it, at, uh, according to the estimation in that sector, so HFC 134A and may be phased down faster than the Kikari amendment, much faster. This is the estimation currently. Um, we all know China, China is decided, the, Dr. Ling already mentioned 2060, the carbon neutrality include all the greenhouse gases, or we say including, including suppose, including the short life climate pollutants. But uh, unlike methane, unlike CO2, unlike N2O, HFC is a delay emission. So, or it's to say this HFC consumption they used today will be discharged or emitted 10 or 20 years or even 30 years later. So when we consider future strategy, we will also evaluate all future consumption of HFC and what's the impact on the radio forcing in 2060. So the, the, I think it, this is uh, not, I think this is not only from the perspective of GWP, but also from the atmosphere concentration of HFC, the influence to the to 2060. And the lifetime of this HFC is very important, not only GWP, but also lifetime future concentration radio forcing. Uh, so that's uh, what uh, we may focus on. In short, we are very confident we will discover the mitigation potential of HFC in future. So we, how to deal with the 2060 neutrality or near zero emission. So of course, technology and the funding issues is very important to phase out, phase down, but uh, our willingness and the determination, I will say, are the most important. 
And uh, once again, thank you for the invitation and I hope we can work to the, together. We have an opportunity to cooperation on these SLCP issues. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, and, and thank you for your ongoing work. Um, it's an incredibly important issue as you, as you touched on. HFCs, if they were not gonna be phased out, could actually completely overwhelm the climate system given the growth that we expect in air conditioning alone. Um, so now let me turn it over to Matt Botill with uh, the Air Resources Board. Matt, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Ken. And I really appreciated the presentation from Nina and Professor Lynn and uh, and the comments that we just had too. It, the it really, really just great work. Um, you know, pulling together the uh, scenarios for kind of midterm and long-term, looking at potential emissions, looking at mitigation opportunities um, and, and cost curves. I've, I've got a ton of questions, really excited about it. Really want to actually just, you know, share that with the team too here at CARB so that they can they can take a look at it. So just, you know, big thank you. Um, I'm glad we, we kind of ended there on, on the HFC piece because that was one of the comments that, that I wanted to make as well. You know, right now, California um, is, is really in the middle of, of trying to, to plan out pathways to, to, to carbon neutrality. And so, you know, we haven't landed on exactly what it's going to look like for the state, and of course, it'll, it'll change as, as time marches forward here. But um, we're looking at a couple of endpoints. We're looking at, you know, achieving carbon neutrality by 2045 as one endpoint, or under a more accelerated timeline, achieving carbon neutrality by 2035. And what would the the kind of the mix of energy and and um, fugitive emissions and uh, strategies and, and natural working lands um, need to be to to hit either one of those endpoints? And one of the things that, that keeps coming up, and I think we're, you know, Ken is making this point as well, is the, the growth of um, refrigerant emissions and how that could really work, you know, pretty strongly against our, our carbon neutrality objectives, if not not really managed closely and, and, and tackled. And so, you know, we're seeing that through some of our preliminary work as well as um, we push for uh, efforts to um, you know, electrify the transportation fleet, um, electrify buildings, move away from uh, fossil fuels more broadly. And we also see a warming planet. We're seeing increases in um, in refrigeration systems and heating and cooling. And um, those are, if they're electrified, also going to, to need refrigerants. And so having a strategy, having a clearly identified set of technologies, having you know identified the potential uh, cost for those uh, alternative technologies, low GWP technology is really important for California, something that, that we've been working on for a number of years now and, and are flagging as part of our carbon neutrality efforts as a, as a a big need, and so good to see that that was really highlighted here. Um, you know, like I said, I have I have lots of questions, but maybe what I'll do really quickly is just talk about the California context, and and we can kind of go into a Q and A if you, if you all want to. But um, you know, for California, for the better part of the last decade, um, we've been working on reducing short-lived climate pollutants, and we really kind of accelerated our work on re reducing short-lived climate pollutants um, over the last few years with the adoption of our short-lived climate pollutant strategy, which, you know, again, thank you for calling that out in the report and identifying some of the targets for reductions for methane, black carbon, HFCs um, that we have here in, in the state. Um, largely, those strategies are, are the things that, that you included in your mitigation approaches. So how do we reduce um, uh, fugitive methane emissions from oil and gas activities, and reducing those methane emissions from uh, the ag sector, particularly for dairy and livestock, as well as from the, the waste sector. Um, and then we've also been, you know, obviously working on reducing HFC emissions from refrigeration systems. Um, black carbon's proved to be a little trickier because of its source of emissions. We've got a, our mobile source strategies that are reducing uh, black carbon emissions from combustion of fossil fuels, but we've also got significant wildfires as we were commenting before we jumped on this call. And, and so as we chart a path towards carbon neutrality, we're also going to now have to start including some of these emissions coming off of natural and working lands and, and um, taking a look at, at black carbon as well as, as part of that. Um, and so a big challenge there um, ahead of us. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the things that I wanted to kind of convey, and, and I think that the report also captures this, is that, you know, California has um, really jumped into this space to try and identify what those mitigation opportunities are, whether it's, you know, uh, 
placing a dairy digester on a uh, on manure uh, methane emissions or a landfill gas capture system at landfills um, or looking at uh, fixing leaks and oil and gas uh, systems to be able to to push the mitigation approaches forward for other states and other nations um, you know, for California, we, we've set these ambitious targets for short-lived climate pollutant reductions for carbon neutrality. We're working towards those with, with incentive programs, with regulations. But at the end of the day, the, the, you know, if, if this cannot be a California-only problem, it's not a California-only problem. And so seeing you know, the, the opportunities for mitigation from, from China, seeing the scale of those emission reductions, I mean, absolutely dwarf California's by order of magnitude. So, um, you know, really encouraged by, by the, the clear kind of pathway options that, that uh, LBNL that you all have uh, laid out here in the report. So, um, you know, Ken, I don't know if, uh, if, if you want me to ask questions, but I do have a couple, if that's all right. Yeah, feel free. Uh, it, it, it's um, certainly not, I'm not going to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I think we well, one of those, and we kind of tackled this on the HFC discussion, but, you know, to what extent, you know, Nina and Professor Lin, did, did you look at kind of the interaction of various decarbonization strategies for China? So, you know, we talk a little bit about like advancing building decarbonization, um, you know, more reliance on, on, on heat pumps and, 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 you know, increasing need for electricity transmission and distribution that can lead to SF6 emissions, you know, if not managed. So, so did you look at these different kind of varying effects uh, of the strategies for the CO2 sectors? Because you know, obviously, that's something that's very important. As we mitigate CO two, we have these other strategies that could have you know adverse impacts on HFC emissions. So, so how did you approach that? Those problems. Well, Matt, thanks. Those terrific questions. I think we have considered some interactions, but not all of them you identified. For example, in the heat pump application, um, most of the room ACs are now heat pump um, type, and uh, so we model that. Uh, uh, pretty carefully in terms of the efficiency improvement, as well as refrigerant transition. There's a part of trickiness in terms of refrigerant piece itself. And I think Professor who identified that R290 is potentially a very attractive uh, alternative refrigerant. Uh, it does have some safety concern at the moment. And that's potentially an area of uh, joint work to make sure that a better alternative is much more accepted by marketplace. Um, Nina, do you want to add anything to that? Sure, I'll be happy to. So on the energy sector side, we definitely consider all of these um, decarbonization strategies, including, you know, very aggressive electrification, particularly for the building sector, but also to slightly uh, lesser degree for industry as well as transport. And we consider things like um, activity demand reduction um, for both industrial, you know, heavy industry products, but also for transport activity. So I think in the sense that all of those reduce the demand for fossil fuel combustion, then that kind of carries through in terms of reducing the methane and into emissions that are coming from oil and gas, for example. Um, so I think that connection is definitely there. But we did note that I think by 2050, the non-CO2 greenhouse gases that were coming from the energy sector was very, very small. I think it was around 5% or so because we had already decarbonized so much um, in terms of tackling all the CO2 mitigation strategies. The only one we haven't considered considered was uh, CCS, but everything else that typically mentioned, we already considered on the energy side and for CO2 mitigation. Yeah, I think that's that's fantastic, and I, I, I was I, I originally saw that slide with the mitigation costs and kind of taken aback a little bit. Saw the the cost mitigation or the, the mitigation cost for the oil sector, and, and kind of inadvertently thought that that was the, the the gas savings. And then you know on, on the far left there, and the far left there's that little bar that's actually the the, the negative mitigation costs around oil and gas, but uh, or the gas system. And you know, really thought you know this is a, this is kind of a key part of the analysis, right? Like, how does the decarbonization strategies moving out of fossil gas um, uh, mean? What does that mean for potential non-CO2 so you know fugitive methane reductions going forward? But that that negative mitigation potential really just highlights the importance of being able to to and have jurisdictions put those strategies forward because they're cost savings and make those happen now. Um, even if you know we're going to move out of the fossil gas system in the long term, and so so clear opportunities there for for, for California for other jurisdictions, um, regardless of what your your kind of decarb strategies look like. So, so appreciate that. So I I have a, a question on the cost chart as well. I I was 
intrigued, um, concerned to see that the enteric emissions came out to be quite expensive. And I'm wondering why uh, you came to that conclusion. So the data source of that are both Chinese and international when combined essentially to research uh, what we can find in China, but also uh, what's available on uh, some of the EPA report, YASA report numbers. And that, that's how it came about. I think changing essentially animal fee is a primary strategy for that. Uh, and there, you know, it's fairly new uh, mitigation measure for this way and hasn't really been scaled up very much. And that cost could come down as the technology matures. But right now there's like tiny, tiny, you know, penetration in the marketplace. That's probably the principal issue in that um, part of the cost. Um, yeah, I, t I actually spoke to somebody from the dairy industry in California yesterday. Today, today yesterday, I can't remember. But at any rate, um, their feeling, at least initially, is that depending on what the feed additives might be, that it may actually be, you know, inconsequential cost. Uh, so I'm hoping that that's the ultimate result. But as you say, we 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 don't know yet. Right, like like the sea, seaweed, right? <laughs> seaweed, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. Oranges, yeah. garlic, yeah. all kinds right. of things. Right. Yeah. So yeah, the whole I, ag, ag sector opportunity are vast that hasn't been really fully explored. That's hope we we'll, would like to do some research on that next. Yeah. Matt, you can say something? Yeah, no, I was just going to kind of, you know, agree with what Ken was saying in terms of what, what we've been hearing. Like there's the, there's a lot of excitement within, I think, the industry around a potential enteric strategy that's low cost because it can really help to, to, to drive down methane emissions from enteric methane emissions. And so a little surprised to see that high, high kind of co mitigation cost on there, but um, we'd love to, to, to learn more about that. We'd we'll love to follow up on that. Yeah, it yeah. was both of you on that. Yeah. Can I have a question for Professor Hu? Great. Okay. So Professor, it's really great to hear the kind of research you just finished in terms of utilizing HFCs. I mean, it's a wonderful idea to not only treat at the pollutant, but also at the potential useful feedstock for other applications. With regard to the HFC consumption issue you raised, are you alluding to essentially the banking issue and, and potentially how you might recycle refrigerant that's going to be in the current stock and the future stock of air conditioners? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. And uh, in actually, I think it, this is a very important lessons learned from Japan and for, from Germany. I'm not sure you, how about the US, but you, you know it's very well. I think in Japan, they did a very good job on the recycling. So this is one thing. And uh, we actually, we, we, we have a lot of problem to dealing with recently. Like Nina showed the presentation, the China emission of the greenhouse gases. Everybody say HFC and some other non-CO2 is small part. It's like, uh, I think Nina presented is totally 18% of the total greenhouse gases, but uh, uh, methane and the N2O it's like 17 or 16 something. They say HFC, PFC, SF6 is very small. But the, the difference, SF6, HFC especially, a lot of it is, uh, it is stockpile in some way. It's a delay emission. So we estimated, like you mentioned, China manufacture a lot chemical and the products export to US also. I think it, every year the amount is, is about 200 million if you calculate by CO2, CO2, 200 million ton per year HFC. And in the same time, China consuming HFC like air condition, automobile and other facility. So this is emission is delay emission. We definitely should consider recycle. So in our strategy, if you don't consider recycle, I don't think you can meet the 2060 
neutrality. Even you consider <laughs> recycle, <laughs> even you consider recycle, it's still challenging. But uh, you you do recycle, uh, you will reduce emission. You will reduce emission. That's very important. And uh, recycle issues, we will say how you find uh, um, policy to incentive to make incentive for the company for the people to do recycle. So the good things is the carbon trading is already started in China. You probably know per ton CO two is like ten dollars, ten dollar per ton CO two. The price is fifty Chinese yuan or something like that. But the future. You you will in your presentation in your research also you you showed that the, the the carbon price definitely will grow. So at that time we do recycle HFC. I think it is essential and possible because the economic incentive is existed. So we strongly suggest to, to start to make a policy, make a law, and. Uh, to develop the, the recycling strategy. Thank you, John. So I have, I have a, a couple of, I think, quick questions from the Q&A. The, the first one is um, that the report analyzes anthropogenic methane emissions. Have you looked at all at natural methane emissions? Um, do you have any evaluation of that? John or Nina, do you want to? That's a tough question, Ken. It is a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have not really uh, modeled that yet. Um, so the partly has to do with data availability issues. How do we reconcile with uh, you know different measurements? So our starting point was really the national inventory data that the Chinese government have compiled that allow us to build a bottom-up model to track. Uh, the human contribution to that. Uh, there's much more complexity to, you know, to, to model or track all the natural occurring mass emissions as well. So we haven't done that part yet. Yeah, and that's really, um, you, you know, that's the tracking I think needs to be around change from baseline. Mm -hmm. So if, if, we, if we have a starting place for the natural emissions, what we really care about from there is, are they increasing because of permafrost melt or whatever other reason? Um, and, and so that becomes a more complex set of issues. Mm -hmm. um, the, other, the other question I think is very easy. They wanted to know if uh, the presentation uh, about your report will be available after, after this uh, webinar. Yes, yes. <laughs> Do you, uh, well, uh, um, on the... CCCI website or somewhere else? Right, I think the report is already available on CCCI website. We'll make the presentation available. We'll work with uh, uh, Toy and others at CCCI to make that available to people. Okay, great. Well, I, um, you guys were terrific. The, the um, presentations were great. Thank you for an excellent discussion. I'm gonna do like a 30 second wrap up here. Um, it, I, I think what you've identified and expressed were some really huge opportunities. Um, the report identifies coal, rice, enteric, oil, um, and it, you know some very big chances, I think, to work together, California, China, um, beyond that as well. On the HFC uh, front, uh, Professor Hu, the 200 million tons a year, that is a, a big number and extremely worth our uh, focus. I was really taken with the idea that the uh, mobile HFC 134A could be phased down faster than uh, Kigali, um, which is, would be fantastic. We'd get a real benefit from that. Um, and then Matt, you identified a lot of the California strategies. And of course, right now, the one that we're really focused on and concerned about is uh, black carbon and fire. So uh, we have some work to do. And unfortunately, that's a worldwide problem as well. But um, my biggest takeaway here is 
how many places there are to work together and to make some uh, potentially fairly fast uh, progress on um, one of the biggest opportunities that we have uh, to address climate quickly. Um, so thank you all very, very much. Excellent presentation. Um, if folks want to hear the recording of it, it'll be available on the website as well, and the presentation will be there as well. Um, thank you all, and thanks for joining us, um, and look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you, thank you Ken. Thanks, Professor thank and Matt, for thank joining you. us. Bye-bye. 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 B